So this video will probably be one of the most useful ones for people actually looking to buy NVIDIA Ampere, the actual shoppers, not just the people that are interested in this tech, but interested in buying this tech. And that's because I'm going to go through what I know when it comes to the actual launch schedule of several Ampere products and the availability of some of the top ones. But before I get into that, I do want to touch on just a few of the various leaks coming out of the Ampere rumor mill right now. And man, is that rumor mill spinning at full speed. Of all of the debatable rumors and leaks coming out right now, the first ones I want to touch on are the nodes that NVIDIA Ampere will use in the gaming lineup. You know, is it 7 nanometer, 5 nanometer, Samsung, TSMC? Is it secretly Global Foundry's 12 nanometer? No, I'll confirm it's not. I'm just going to openly admit that determining the node of Ampere, at least for the gaming lineup, has been a confusing ordeal over the well over more than the past few months. The original set of Ampere information I had was mostly me and a few of my initial sources guessing that it had to be on TSMC 7 nanometer with the power usage and high clock speed numbers we were seeing. Seemed like a solid guess. And sure, later samples got higher power consumption, but correspondingly higher performance as well. So despite all of the rumors that much of the lineup would be made at Samsung, we assumed the top had to be at TSMC. But as more and more info came out that AMD and TSMC were best of friends and that TSMC was getting tired of working with Nvidia, that became questioned more. And then of course, a little over a month ago, I became aware of samples around one of my sources that were using far, far more energy than the initial ones, and they weren't getting more performance for the extra power usage. Thus, me and many of my sources that I talked to assumed, yeah, I guess I don't know, maybe they are just testing an entire lineup at both Samsung and TSMC, and maybe they're just being forced to launch something that's going to be way more power hungry than people expected. And I apologize for how flip-floppy it sounds. It's, I mean, I've been confused. Heck, you know, one person I talked to in NVIDIA's Quadro division said, and I quote, looks like only a handful of the new GeForce cards will get TSMC fabs like us. So that does sound like a lot of the Quadro lineup is still planned to be on TSMC, but that he's still not honestly sure he might have just been guessing for the most part. It's mixed reports on where it's coming from. And then recently, there was this interesting conversation from the last Broken Silicon episode with Daniel Nenny, a very well-informed founder of SemiWiki.com. I, I mean, honestly, from what I'm told from behind the scenes is that NVIDIA didn't expect TSMC to do that and that this is actually throwing them through a loop right now. Yeah, you know, uh, they did the same thing with Xilinx and Altera. Then they did it with Qualcomm. And, uh, you know, when Apple came to TSMC, Apple got even better treatment than Qualcomm. And But um, it's not like they're moving products back and forth. So, again, you know, there's wafer agreements that are signed, mm -hmm. you know, two or more years in advance. And there's NDAs signed. So they can't actually design the same product to the same foundries. So uh, NVIDIA is, is designing some products to TSMC and some products to Samsung. They can't be the same team. The same design team can't design hmm. on Samsung and TSMC because there's confidentiality agreements. Um, so it has so, to be enormously expensive <laughs> or infeasible to design literally everything at both. Yeah, it's just not, it's not done because it's really not feasible uh, technically or legally. So what they have to do is they have to decide on the process technology when they start designing. And so they get the PDK, they sign the NDA, and they say, okay, this one's going here. But, you know, and NVIDIA has many different product types, right? Mm -hmm. So some of them will go TSMC, some of them will go Samsung. I mean, if, if you go exclusive to one company, you don't have the pricing benefits of, of competition. And Samsung is known for really good pricing because, mm -hmm. again, yeah, they, their foundry business is buried inside. They don't have to make money. In fact, they probably don't because their yield is so bad. Now, I personally took this to mean it would just be really expensive to do this, not impossible to dual source. Remember, there can be a soft design team doing some pretty in-depth work that then throws the main architecture over to two separate hard design teams, and they complete it. One would be at TSMC, and one would be at Samsung. This is rare, 
but not unprecedented, by the way, people. Apple did just this before. They made two different versions of the same chip, and yeah, because of that, they actually had varying die sizes and power consumption, and it actually backfired on them a little bit. But, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. NVIDIA could be doing this too. And in fact, there was much more to this. I spoke with Daniel again after the podcast, and he had a lot more to say. First of all, he wanted to emphasize that you can't literally make the same chip on two different nodes, as I explained with Apple's circumstances, but you can make a similar design on two nodes. And again, NVIDIA would be insane to trust their entire lineup to Samsung. They had to be making some of their cards on TSMC in case Samsung falls through. And additionally, that when you're talking about Samsung, Samsung 7 nanometer is only about a 20% EUV node that designing some of the lineup at 8 nanometer and 7 nanometer and moving some designs between them wouldn't be impossible that, yeah, we could expect some of the designs to be on Samsung 7 nanometer, some of them on TSMC 7 nanometer, that that would correspond with what Jensen said about most 7 nanometer going to TSMC. Maybe it's just a few Halo products that are less efficient on Samsung 7 nanometer, and maybe the rest of the lineup is on 8. But nonetheless, the biggest thing he talked about, and again, I want to emphasize that I'm not ruling out TSMC 7 nanometer for the 3090. It could be. But he did emphasize that there's a way to explain the erratic clock speeds and still have it basically all be Samsung 7 nanometer for the high-end gaming lineup. He says, if you'll remember, and this is out there publicly to a certain degree, Samsung 7 nanometer wasn't a real note in 2019. By the end of last year, it was still in single digit yields. But by early 2020, it was at 30% yield rates. That's kind of like Ice Lake 10 nanometer yield rates there. Not very good, but there could be some good samples. I'm sure Samsung was just agreeing to give them a certain amount of working samples for software development. And that means they could have basically been sending them mostly golden samples because those were the only ones that were really working and worth sending over. Most of them were garbage. And then over time, they got the yields up more and more and more. And I've been told today that Samsung 7 nanometer is probably around an 80% yield rate. It's not as good as TSMC, but it's definitely good enough for mass manufacturing. And Samsung charges at least 30% less per 7 nanometer wafer compared to TSMC. So at least NVIDIA is making some more money per chip sold. And so do you see what I'm getting to here? The point that I'm working towards? In January, reports came out from DigiTimes that NVIDIA planned to use Samsung 7 nanometer node. And in fact, a year before that, there were other sources already saying that NVIDIA was targeting Samsung for their next generation lineup. And that probably would have been right before they started to produce samples for software development, the final stages. Their hard design team was ordering samples to be tested. And a lot of those may have performed far better than what the final average will perform. Remember, in Intel's had Ice Lake Xeon samples with high core counts since 2018. But how many of those could they actually make? I'm sure some of them were incredibly impressive, but I don't know how many they made. And so that's what I think is going on. I think they partnered with Samsung. They have the design library there and their early samples they were testing were like only the best of the best of those early yields. And by now, as time goes on, as you get closer to a launch, you get to the final reality check. Okay, now they're just sending us full wafers. How well do these perform on average? The best samples are going to have to go to Quadro if everything's made on Samsung. And I have been told from a source at Quadro in NVIDIA that the top Q6000 is a 300 watt card with full GA102. That to me sounds like something that's probably just underclocked a little bit, but is those golden samples. And yields are improving, but they're going to slightly disable it and sell you a real power hungry RTX 3090. Although I am also told that the availability of the 3090 is not going to be very good. I have an exact number actually and how many will be available in the first month or so. And I can't say what it is, but it's, it's a very small number. And then it's just the 3080 
which if you look at the rumored core config of the 3080, yeah, that's disabled by, what, at least 20% or more. So there may be plenty of supplies of 3080s, and that's how they get it down to 320 watts. And as the dies get smaller, like with GA104 with the RTX 3070, power consumption is not as much of an issue. Samsung's good, or at least okay, at making decently efficient dies that are small. But when you get bigger, it gets out of control and erratic, and you get enthusiast graphics cards that are power hogs when they have a gigantic die size on a node like this. A node that we know is some kind of 7 nanometer. And so one more time, let me say, I'm not 100% sure of this theory that what's been going on the entire time is just NVIDIA sticking with 7 nanometer at Samsung. But I do think this theory makes sense. And at the very least, I think this is an educational section of the video to make people understand why we usually see so many ultra impressive early samples that later get tweaked down to lower performance. They make final tweaks at the very end of the design phase for higher yields that usually lowers top end performance. And in fact, people may want to remember this when they think of previous designs that we thought might clock higher. But I think that's enough rambling about the node. Like I said near the beginning, the node doesn't really matter. What does is the features and performance. And again, I've consistently said a few things about Ampere. Blazingly fast memory, incredible ray tracing performance, performance of rasterization of at least 40% higher than the 2080 Ti and maybe even above 50% in some games. And actually guys, from what I've heard, it could be a pretty damn good overclocker too. It's just, yeah, make sure you have a powerful power supply and a lot of air conditioning if you push it. Because if you push it, and you might get really good performance boost from overclocking, you could be pushing over 400 watts. And again, I will confirm this again. Yes, the Founders Edition of the 3090 is probably around 350 watts at stock settings, but many AIB models are pushing north of 380 watts. There will probably be 400 watt models, as I've reported. But the performance uplift will be there correspondingly with this higher power consumption. NVIDIA wants to give you this fall that Pascal-like feeling of everything has changed, games we couldn't play before at certain settings, now we can. And they want this right before Cyberpunk. And remember, it's the top cards that will use a bunch of energy, no matter what node they're on. The 3070 should use between 200 and 230 watts. With Ray tracing performance above anything out right now, and rasterization performance, as I confirmed on Twitter a few days ago, around a 2080 Ti. And if the 3070 is around a 2080 Ti, again, do the math, yeah, the 3080 is going to be really powerful, and the 3090 exceedingly powerful. And I think even the 3060, for probably around $400, should be around a 2080 Super in rasterization performance, while delivering you, again, ray tracing far above what you would get from a mid-range card just a few months ago. Actually, that RTX 3070 tweet was thrown out there with a little hint at what the release schedule will be for the lineup. And that's because I've known this for over a week, guys. But I wasn't allowed to say it yet in worries that this could burn sources. So I waited, but I wanted you guys to know that I've known for a while because I know other people are starting to spread this as well. I mean, AIBs know now, so I'm sure many more people are telling others. I'm not going to do this. Oh, I'm the first. But I do trust this source that told me a lot. And so I'm willing to go forward with it now when these graphics cards are coming out. And actually, before we get into when they're coming out, let me say this too. It sounds to me like you shouldn't expect too many TIs or Supers in this lineup without going into too much detail for reasons i can't say nvidia does want to standardize their tiers and one reason i can say is they legitimately think consumers are getting confused you know i mean think about it there's a what a 1650 a 1650 super and a 1650 ti but only sold in laptops and there's a 1660 a 1660 super a 1660 ti this is objectively confusing to anyone but the most keyed-in enthusiast. NVIDIA wants to standardize their tiers, make it easy for customers to understand what they're buying. They want to go, you know, 30, 30, 30, 40, 30, 50, 30, 60, 30, 70, 30, 80, and 30, 90. And in fact, I think the 30, 90 naming scheme is 
a very understandable move, right? NVIDIA expects AMD to be much more competitive, possibly pushing out a 16 or 24 gigabyte card around the $1,000 to $1,500 mark. So if AMD is going to do that, and they're going to have more performance relative to NVIDIA than the previous generation, well, NVIDIA needs to increase VRAM amounts for their top-end models. But what do they do, right? Do they make a Titan 24 gigabyte that's $1,500? NVIDIA doesn't want to move prices down ever again. They want to keep those Turing prices. And so that's why I believe the 3090 was born. It was born to kind of hide that they're jacking up the price on the 3080 Ti. But they're not going to give it the plan 12 gigs of RAM. They're going to give it 24 gigabytes. And so the 3090 is also kind of what they were going to make the Titan if AMD wasn't competing. In other words, the 3090, that naming scheme is a move by NVIDIA to both hide that they're jacking up the price on the 3080 Ti and also hide that they're forced to bring down the price on the Titan. All right, so that's what I know about how NVIDIA plans to arrange and name their tiers in the Ampere lineup. How about I finally tell you when the hell these things are launching? Now, I'm aware other people have leaked these things already, and honestly, these dates are really close to what I was told by someone I trust quite a bit but they're not exactly the same. It's a bit later than what I was told, but these things vary. And I'm not gonna say an exact day because I, again, want to avoid giving away a source. But I will say this. The RTX 3080 10 gigabyte is coming out in mid-September. And in fact, samples should be shipping to reviewers within a week based on previous timing of other launches. 3090 shelf availability should be one week after the RTX 3080, though it will likely paper launch the same day the 3080 launches. And again, it sounds like the 3090 will have very limited availability. I can't elaborate on the exact number, but very limited. That's what, again, kind of makes me lean towards this one's also just made at Samsung. After the 3090, the 3080 20 gigabyte should launch by the end of September. And I just suspect that in general, this is when the 3080 AIB models will also be out with their 10 or 20 gigabytes. And it's also worth pointing out actually about this 3080 20 gigabyte that it is very likely a de facto defense against whatever big RDNA 2 is. If big RDNA 2 manages to beat the RTX 3080, NVIDIA has said that they know that if two cards are similar performance, or even if one card's a lot more performance, if one of them has more memory, people tend to buy the one with more memory. So this is kind of a way to uh, keep away a 12 gigabyte 3080 killer because they may be able to price a 20 gigabyte model slightly higher. And that will also kind of act as a de facto 3080 Ti they're hoping to not have to launch a 3080 Ti. Anyways, though, yada, yada, yada. Moving forward, the RTX 3070 launches in very early October. I personally don't have a word on the RTX 3060, but I believe it's based on the same die as the 3070. And with that in mind, yeah, I think the 3060 is going to launch late October or early November, depending on how long it takes for old Turing card stock to dry up. Because remember, discounted Turing cards will probably be priced around where the 3060 is. So they might wait for that. And also, there may be 16 gigabyte models of the 3070 and the 3060 as well. Again, I think it depends a little bit on how much VRAM RDNA 2 cards come with as standard. And finally, what the hell is going on with the Titan? I mean, if the 3090 is 24 gigabyte, may we need to take those rumors of a 48 gigabyte Titan seriously? Yeah, I, I don't know, honestly. I do know that Micron's bringing out faster memory later this year, so maybe the Titan's just a 24 gigabyte 3090, but with faster RAM, but most rumors don't put point to it being faster. Here's my argument for why NVIDIA may actually launch a 48 gigabyte Titan. It'd be partially for the same reason they launch a 20 gigabyte 3080. They know a big number is just going to get people to buy it to a certain degree. But also, I've been told by people working with the Quadro team at NVIDIA that NVIDIA isn't planning to want to launch a Quadro 8000, that the full GA102 will be in the Quadro 6000 this gen and be around four to $4,500. And at 48 gigabytes. Do you see where I'm going with this? If there's a four to $4,500 48 gigabyte Quadro, I could see a $3,000 48 gigabyte Titan, maybe even 3,500. 
And yeah, that kind of slots in, in between where a 24 gigabyte Quadro would go in a 48 gigabyte. And so if you just want the higher clock speeds, you don't need some of the software features of a Quadro. Well, the Titan's priced around the price of a Quadro anyways. And so that would explain why they're willing to give it 48 gigabytes at the end of the day. Again, they may have some yields of the full 5,376 cuticore die that they can't get even with underclocking to be around the 300 watts professionals need. Professionals want that standard. So they may have a 48 gigabyte card that uses a boatload of energy, and then they just might price it like a Quadro for those who don't care about the efficiency but want an insane amount of memory and performance. And that's basically what I know about Ampere. The launch schedule, the final performance numbers, and the note it's probably on. Although again, I don't think the node really matters. It's probably Samsung 7 nanometer, but again, I am told they're making some of their quadros besides A100 on TSMC 7 nanometer still. So I just wouldn't rule out the 3090. Either way, it will have limited availability, the RTX 3090 whale, and it could be for a multitude of reasons, whether on Samsung or TSMC. Now I do have a few other tidbits about RDNA 2 and some other things relating to Ampere as well. But first I wanna run this new goofy ad with one of my best sponsors. Gosh, Reese, why does Windows 10 Professional have to be so expensive? Don't listen to that, nerd. Listen to me. You can get all the great Windows and gaming keys you need at CDK Offers. I have a plan. Go to cdkoffers.com to get all the Windows Professional and Microsoft Office keys you need, and games as well. Add them to your cart, and you can even apply one of them city slicker promotional codes like Dashrank for 3% off software and Broken Silicon for 25% off all Windows codes. I do have an account on this website, and it is ultra easy to use. Just submit your order, use PayPal, credit card, or Bitcoin, and go to Windows website to download Microsoft Professional. One more time, that's go to cdkoffers.com. They are a fantastic sponsor of Moore's Law is Dead. Use offer code DOSHRINK for 3% off everything on the website and Broken Silicon for 25% off all Windows products. Now, back to the show. Eh, I thought it was funny. Anyways, some final tidbits. Basically, what I'm told is that NVIDIA may be pushing for their Quadro samples to be tested on Threadripper 3960X rigs because it has PCIe 4.0 and because, you know, you're going to be able to do SLI with the new NVLink with these top end cards and they want the full PCIe x 16 4.0 bandwidth. This is a problem for Intel. They can't even be considered for some of the best card testing anymore even according to NVIDIA themselves. And in fact, I have received a little bit of information here that there is a chance that despite you being told those new top-end Comet Lake motherboards will support Rocket Lake, that some of them might not. That there was a last-minute change that required more power phases to support Rocket Lake. And so some of those Comet Lake motherboards may not even support Rocket Lake and PCIe 4.0. And so that's all I can really say about that is be wary about buying even mid-range boards for Comet Lake and hoping you can upgrade to Rocket Lake. Really, again, guys, no one should be buying Intel anymore. They are just inferior to AMD. That's really is not related to Ampere or RDNA 2, but I thought I would say it now because some of you might care to know this. And then finally, the final tidbits, they're about RDNA 2. I'm starting to receive a bit more information, but I have decided I have no need for 30-minute videos anymore, that I should try to keep them as short as possible to make one specific point. And that point is that Ampere, the top models, will use a lot of energy, but that they will also deliver a lot of performance and excellent new software features that really, if you want to get a high-end card, it's going to be the 3080, and that's coming out slightly before the 3090. And that if you want something that is still impressive and doesn't break your power budget, the 3070 is coming before Thanksgiving, and it's going to be great as well. And if you're waiting for a big Navi, well, without going into too much detail, this will be in another video. It is more efficient than people expect. It is more powerful than most are reporting, in my opinion. And 
it may even be launching sooner than you think. But that's all I can say for now, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want more, a new die shrink just came out about the early LCD panel days and the late CRT days. There's a lot of performance things. I think people forget about how bad and good some of those products were about 20 years ago. And listen to that if you're a patron. And also remember to subscribe to Broken Silicon on your preferred podcast app. Subscribe to Moore's Law is Dead on YouTube. Ring the bell button. Share my videos. Yada, yada, yada. And most of all, thank you for watching. Have a fantastic weekend.